Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. So the angel that will subdue Satan is anonymous. It is not Jesus himself, nor is it Michael or Gabriel or any other high-ranking angel. Just a regular angel. And so the final importance of Satan is perhaps indicated in the fact that it is not the Father who deals with him, nor the Christ, but only an unnamed angel. And this is a dramatic declaration that Satan is not God's opposite or equal, and that God could easily stop Satan's activity at any time. Yet God allows Satan to continue because even in his evil, he indirectly serves the purposes of God. Verses 2 and 3. He laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shuts him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things he must be released for a little while. So Satan tried to imprison Jesus in the tomb, but he couldn't. Here God has no problem restraining Satan. And this incarceration is not for punishment, but restraint. So by implication, Satan's demonic armies are also restrained and imprisoned. So is this a literal transaction? Certainly it is. The battle is literal, the taking of the beast and false prophet is literal, and the slaying of the kings and their armies is literal, Satan is literal, and his binding must equally be literal. It would not resolve itself into anything else. So some people ask, what kind of chain can hold the devil? We don't know, but God can fashion a chain for that exact purpose. We know that right now there are demonic spirits who are imprisoned and chained in Jude verse 6 where it says, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains of darkness for the judgment of the great day. So perhaps some spiritual chain that works on them. So if God can chain them now, he can chain Satan for a thousand years. So the elaborate measures taken to ensure his custody are most easily understood as implying the complete cessation of his influence on the earth, rather than the curbing of his activities. Some take this as Satan's binding on a personal level, uh, believing that it refers to how Satan's work can be restrained in the life of an individual. But this view does not take the text seriously. If God did want to tell us of the total inactivity of Satan, how could he have said it any stronger than this? So this shows that there is no man who simply binds Satan with his prayer. This is a work done on divine initiative. One very important detail is to notice that the conquest of Satan and his powers does not come by any human effort. And this is going to show us that he should deceive the nations no more. It shows us that Satan's main mode of attack is revealed. Satan is a deceiver. So the most potent defense and weapon against Satan is the truth of God's word. And so the truth is ever against him. Therefore, falsehood is his particular recourse and instrument. But naked falsehood is only repulsive. What we know to be a lie cannot com command our respect. Untruth can only gain credence and acceptance by being so disguised as to appear to be the truth. So falsehood can have no power over us until we are led to believe and conclude that it is the truth. And this deluding of men, getting them to accept and follow lies and false hopes under the persuasion that they are accepting and following the truth is the great work and business of Satan in every age. And since Satan's work of deception continues today, we know that he is not bound in the way that this passage describes. We know that Satan was not bound at the finished work of Jesus on the cross, at the resurrection, or at the founding of the church. We know this because Peter said that Satan was free to walk a walk about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour in first peter chapter 5 verse 8 so satan continues to effectively deceive people not only make falsehoods speak falsehoods print falsehoods and believe falsehoods but they eat them drink them wear them act them live them and make them one of the great elements of their being especially today and so this thousand year period is often known as the millennium and through church history, there's been many different ways of understanding the millennium. And the Bible speaks powerfully to other aspects of the millennial earth. Tragically, the church through history has often ignored or denied the promise of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. The early church until Augustine almost universally believed in an earthly historical reign of Jesus initiated by his return. Tychonius in the late 300s was the first to influence... Um, 
influentially champion a spiritualized interpretation, saying that this millennium is now amillennialism and must be understood as a spiritual reign of Jesus, not a literal reign. So, so his, adopt, his view was adopted by Augustine, the Roman Catholic Church, and most Reformation theologians, and it's tragic. So growing out of amillennialism is the doctrine of postmillennialism, saying that the millennium will happen in this age before Jesus' return, but that the church will bring it to pass. Yet the clear teaching of the Bible isn't amillennialism or postmillennialism, but what is called premillennialism. The teaching that Jesus Christ will return to this earth before the millennial earth, and he will establish and govern it directly. And there is no need to say that Satan is only bound in a spiritual sense, and Jesus only rules in a spiritual sense. When we consider the rest of the scriptures, the earthly reign of Christ and his people on this earth is plainly taught in the Old and New Testaments. In the Old Testament, we see it in Psalm 72, where it says, Give the king your judgments, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son, and he will judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. The mountains will bring peace to the people, and the little hills by righteousness. He will bring justice to the poor of the people. He will save the children of the needy and will break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear you as long as the sun and moon endure. Throughout all generations he shall come down like a rain upon the grass before mowing, like showers that water the earth." In his days the righteous shall flourish in abundance of peace until the moon is no more, and he shall have dominion also from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. In Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 4, where it says, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come. Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. It's also in Isaiah 11, verses 4 through 9, where it says, But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide the equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins. And faithfulness the belt of his waist. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, and their young ones shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. And they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. In Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 and 6, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper, and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name, by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. And in many, many more passages. In the New Testament, we see it in Luke chapter 1, verses 32 and 33, where it says, He will be great, he will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, that's an earthly throne, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Matthew chapter 5, verse 18, For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one yacht or one tittle will by no means pass away from the law till all is fulfilled. And Luke 19, verses 12 through 19, will say, Therefore he said, A certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called ten of his servants, delivered to them ten minutes, and said to them, Do business till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Master, your minute has earned ten minutes. He said to him, Well done, good and faithful, because you are faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Master, your minute has earned, earned five minutes. Likewise, he said to him, You also be over five cities, and among other passages as well. So all in all, there are more than 400 verses in more than 20 different passages in the Old Testament which deal with this time when Jesus Christ will rule and reign personally over the planet Earth. So who will be on the Earth in the millennium? 
Even after the rapture and the vast judgments of the great tribulation, there will be many people left on the earth. After Jesus returns in glory, he will judge those who survived the great tribulation and the judgment of the nations. Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. And this is not a judgment unto salvation, but a judgment of moral worthiness and entrance into the millennial kingdom of Jesus. The unworthy will be sent into eternal damnation, and the worthy will be allowed in Jesus' millennial kingdom. So during the millennium, Israel will be the superpower of the world, the leading nation in all the earth. And the center of Israel will be the mountain of the Lord's house, the Temple Mount, which will be the capital of the government of the Messiah. All nations shall flow to the capital of Jesus' government. In Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1-3, through 3, we'll say, The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, now it shall come to pass in the latter days, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. In Ezekiel chapter 17, verse 22 through 24, where it says, Thus says the Lord God, I will take also one of the highest branches of the high cedar and set it out, and I will crop off the topmost of its young twigs, a tender one, and will plant it on high and prominent mountain. On the mountain height of Israel I will plant it, and it will bring forth bows and bear fruit and be a majestic cedar. Under it birds will dwell of every sort, and in the shadow of its branches they will dwell. And all the trees of the field shall know that I, the Lord, have brought down the high tree and exalted the low tree, dried up the green tree and made the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it. So during the millennium, the citizens of the earth will acknowledge and submit to the lordship of Jesus. It will be a time of perfectly administrated and forced righteousness on this earth. From Isaiah chapter 2 verses 1 through 5. And during the millennium, there will be no more war. There will, be, there will still be conflicts between nations and individuals, but they will be justly and decisively resolved by the Messiah and those who reign with him in Isaiah 2 verses 1 through 5. And it isn't the reign of the Messiah itself that will change the heart of man. Citizens of earth will still need to trust in Jesus and in his work on their behalf for their personal salvation during the millennium. But war and armed conflict will not be tolerated. And so during the millennium, the way animals relate to each other and to humans is going to be transformed. A little child will be safe and be able to lead a wolf or a leopard or a young lion or a bear. Even the danger of predators like cobras and vipers is going to be gone. In Genesis chapter 9 verses 2 through 3, the Lord gave Noah and all of mankind after him the permission to eat meat. At the same time, the Lord put the dread of man in animals so they would not be effortless prey for humans. Now, in the reign of the Messiah, that is reversed. For this reason, many think that the reign of the Messiah, the millennium, humans will return to being vegetarians, as it seems they were before Genesis chapter 9, verses 2 and 3, and Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 through 9 as well. So during the millennium, King David will have a prominent place in the millennial earth, ruling over Israel, in Isaiah 55, verses 3 through 5, where it says, Incline your ear and come unto me, here and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The sure mercies of David, indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people, a leader and commander for the people. Surely you shall call a nation you do not know, and nations who do not know you shall run to you, because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. It's also in Jeremiah 30, verses 4 through 11, Ezekiel 34, verse 23 through 31, Ezekiel 37, verse 21 through 28, and Hosea chapter 3, verse 5. And during the millennium, there will be a blessing and security for national Israel. In Amos 9, verse 11 through 15. And the millennium will be a time of purity and devotion to God. In Zechariah chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Where it will say, In that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. It shall be in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land, and they shall no longer be remembered. And I will also cause the prophets and unclean spirits to depart from the land. It shall come to pass that if anyone prophesies, then his father and mother who begot him will say to him, You shall not live, because you have spoken lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and mother who begot him shall thrust him through when he prophesies. And it shall be in that day that every prophet will be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies. They will not wear a robe of coarse hair to deceive. But he will say, I'm no prophet, I'm a farmer. For a man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. And one will say to him, What are these wounds between your arms? Then he will answer, 
those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts. So during the millennium, there will be a rebuilt temple and restored temple on the Restored, uh, restored t- temple service on the earth as a memorial of God's work in the past. That's covered extensively in Ezekiel chapter 40 through 48, and Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 26 through 28, Amos chapter 9, verse 11, and Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 39 through 44. So during the millennium, saints in their resurrected state will be given responsibility in the millennial earth according to their faithful service. So Luke chapter 19, verses 11 through 27 where he speaks the parable about the kingdom of God. And he talks about the certain nobleman who went to a far country to receive a kingdom and to return. <clears throat> In Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 through 6, I saw thrones, and they who sat on them, the judgment was committed to them. And then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 26 through 28, And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces like potter's vessels, as I also have received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. Revelation chapter 3, verses uh, 12 and 22, He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more, and I will write on him the name of my God, and to the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, I will write him my new name. Verse 22, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Plural. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 2 and 3, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? So, thousand years. Is it a literal 1,000 years? Should we take a number literally unless there is a... We should take this number literally unless there's a clear reason or evidence to do otherwise. So, we should take this 1,000 years literally because God has an important work to accomplish during this millennium. The millennium is important because it will demonstrate Jesus' victory and worthiness to rule the nations. The millennium is important because it will reveal the depths of man's rebellious nature in a perfect environment. Some people seem to believe that man is basically good, and deep down he really wants God's righteous rule. Many believe that man is really innocent and corrupted only by a bad environment. So the millennium is going to answer these questions before the great judgment and show that that is not the case at all. Uh, Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. And so the millennium is important because it will display the eternal depravity of Satan, who continues his evil as soon as he's released from his incarceration. And the millennium is important because it will show the invulnerability of the city of God and God's new order. And for those that think that somehow hell is some place of purifying fire that you do, you know, that purifies and you'll come out of it, you'll clearly see at the end of the thousand years that Satan was not purified in the least bit at all. He just goes right back to being himself. So let us rejoice that Scripture is so clear and so explicit upon this great doctrine of the future triumph of Christ over the whole world. We believe that the Jews will be converted and that they will be restored to their own land. We believe that Jerusalem will be the central metropolis of Christ's kingdom. We also believe that all the nations shall walk in the light of the glorious city, which shall be built at Jerusalem. And we expect that the glory which shall have its center there shall spread over the whole world, covering it as with the sea of holiness, happiness, and delight. For this we look with joyful expectation. Verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So who sits on these thrones? Perhaps the 24 elders representing the church from chapter 4, verse 4, or the apostles from Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, or the company of saints as a whole from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 2 and 3. So perhaps this is the judging of angels mentioned in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 2 and 3, but it's more likely that these are the saints ruling on and over the earth. And these saints reign with Jesus for the same period of time that Satan is bound. They administrate the kingdom of Jesus Christ over the earth, 
reigning over those who pass from the earth of the great tribulation to the earth of the millennium. So all those who overcome in Jesus will rule and reign with him in Revelation 2, verse 26 through 28, chapter 3, verse 12 and 22, and 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 2 and 3. So why does John only mention the tribulation saints? They are specifically mentioned so as to encourage them while not implying others will be left out. This is a special vindication for the tribulation saints. They suffered under Antichrist who had said, I will rule the earth. Now they are in authority and Antichrist is destroyed. So these martyrs are literal, but also representative of all that give their lives and faithfulness to Jesus. So beheaded is actually a broader word than we might think. The ancient Greek word really means executed. Verses 5 and 6. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So this first resurrection is the granting of resurrection life and resurrection bodies to all those that are dead in Jesus. This is a resurrection of blessing. It's a resurrection of power and a resurrection of privilege. And those who do not have a part in the first resurrection are not blessed. They're under the power of the second death, and they are without privilege. In John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, Jesus described two resurrections, where he said, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all those who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation talking of two different points. So the two events are separated by this thousand year period because the rest of the dead are not given their resurrection bodies until after the thousand years were finished. And so if the first resurrection is a singular event, then it argues pretty well for a post-tribulation rapture because it implies that all the saints receive their resurrection bodies at the same time immediately before the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. If the first resurrection is an order or class encompassing previously dead believers who are at once with the Lord, the raptured church already in heaven, and saints from the great tribulation, then the idea fits in a pre-tribulation framework. And so it must be especially emphasized that our phrase in the apocalypse covering this resurrection is a retrospect that looks back over all three phrases uh, or phases of resurrection. The first resurrection is not an event, but an order of resurrection, including all the righteous who are raised from the dead before the millennial kingdom begins. Verse 7 and 8. Now when the, na when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them to together to battle, whose number is of the, as the sand of the sea. And so for the thousand years of the direct reign of Jesus over this earth, Satan was bound and inactive. But after that thousand years is over, he's going to be released and successfully organize many people of the earth in another rebellion against God. So if Jesus has reigned so wonderfully for a thousand years, then why will the earth rebel? They will do it and God will allow it as a final demonstration of man's rebellion and depravity. Outward conformity to Jesus' rule will be required during his reign, but seemingly an inward embrace of his lordship will still be up to the individual. This is why I say it's an individual responsibility. So in this, we see more of the important reason God has for the millennial kingdom in allowing this final rebellion. For all of human history, man has wanted to blame his sinful condition on his environment. And of course, I turned out the way I did. Did you see the family I came from? Did you see the neighborhood I grew up in? Well, with the millennial kingdom of Jesus, God will give mankind a thousand years of a perfect environment with no Satan, no crime, no violence, no evil, no other social pathology. But at the end of the thousand years, man will still rebel against God at his first opportunity. This will powerfully demonstrate that the problem is in us, not our environment. So who will these rebels be? They will be those who survive the Great Tribulation, enter into the Millennial Kingdom, and their descendants, infants born during the Millennium, will live to its conclusion and will not be required to make a choice between the devil and Christ until the end. So Gog and Magog, so these are prophetic enemies of Israel in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, but the battle described in those chapters of Ezekiel seems to be very distinct and different from this battle. And John seems to borrow the term and use it as a symbol, 
Seemingly, the battles described in chapter 38 and 39 of Ezekiel take place before the return of Jesus, perhaps right before or during the tribulation. This final battle clearly takes place at the end of the thousand-year reign of Jesus. Verse 9 and 10, They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So we don't know if the saints referred to here are the glorified saints who reign with Jesus or earth inhabitants who come to faith in Jesus during the millennium. Either way, the strategy of this vast satanic army is clear to destroy God's people and the headquarters or the capital city of his administration, Jerusalem. So we shouldn't even call this a final battle because there's no battle. The fight is over before it begins. And at this point, God finally deals with the devil and his followers forever. And after this aborted battle, Satan is then judged and tormented forever, together with the beast and false prophet who were cast into the lake of fire at the beginning of a thousand years in Revelation 19 verse 20. And so the presence of the beast and false prophet in the lake of fire after a thousand years argues against uh, annihilationism. In eternal punishment, a thousand years is just the beginning. It never ends. John Trapp thought this eternal aspect of hell so terrible that he called it another hell in the midst of hell. So is this really eternal punishment? Yes, it is. The words mean exactly what they appear to mean. There would be no way possible in the Greek language to state more emphatically the everlasting punishment of the lost than here in mentioning both day and night and the expression forever and ever, literally to the ages of ages. Verse 11, Then I saw a great white throne in him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. So great in status, power, and authority, white in purity and holiness, and a throne in kingly sovereignty. So him who sat on it, who is this? The Bible tells us that the judge is Jesus. In John chapter 5, verse 22 through 27, or more likely, the fullness of the triune God. And so the earth and heaven flee away from this throne, and there was found no place for them. There is absolutely no hiding from this throne, and no one can escape the judgment that it represents. And so many, even most Bible scholars, believe that Christians will never appear before this great white throne. It isn't because we can hide from it. Nobody can. The idea is that we are spared from this awesome throne of judgment because our sins are already judged in Jesus at the cross. We don't escape God's judgment. We satisfy it in Jesus. So, however, Christians will have to stand before another throne, the judgment seat of Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Therefore, when we pass from these bodies to the world beyond, we must each give account according to what he has done, whether good or bad. This describes a judgment of works of believers. So at the judgment seat of Christ, what we have done will be judged. Our motives for what we have done will be judged. Paul presents essentially the same idea of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12 through 15, where he speaks of a coming assessment of each one's work before the Lord. In that passage, he makes it clear that what we have done and our motive for doing it will be tested by fire, and the purifying fire of God will burn up everything that was not of him. We won't be punished for what was not done rightly unto the Lord. It will simply be burned up, and it will be as if we never did those things. We will simply be rewarded for what remains. Sadly, some will get to heaven thinking they've done great things for God, and will find out at the judgment seat of Christ that they really did nothing. Verse 12 and 13. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. So this is not a trial trying to determine what the facts are. The facts are in, and here's the sentencing of someone who is already condemned. Their standing posture means that they are now about to be sentenced. And so because this is a sentencing and not a trial, those who stand before the throne have nothing to say. Many will think that they will tell God a thing or two at the final judgment, as reflected in the letter to Dear Abby. And of course, there will be no criticism of God on that day. Uh, Unfortunately, you know, those will not only see the righteousness and goodness of God, 
they will also see their own sin and rejection of him more clearly than ever. So one could only pray and hope that they would come to understand how the Father himself knew the pain they experienced and sent his Son to give them hope and redemption. And so if people are not listed in the book of life, then each one is judged according to his works. Those who refuse to come to God to faith by, uh, to fa- by faith will, by be- default, be judged and condemned by their own works. So the issue is not of salvation by works, or, but works as the irrefutable evidence of man's actual relationship with God. And there are degrees of punishment for unbelievers according to their works in Matthew 11, verse 20 through 24. Here is where they are sentenced to their specific eternal punishment. So why does the sea give up its dead? It represents the place of unburied bodies. The emphasis is on the universal character of judgment. Everybody is included. Verse 14 and 15. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So the last echoes of sin are now eliminated. Death is the result of sin and it is gone. Hades is the result of death and it is gone. The last vestiges of sin's unlawful domination are done away with. When a person refers to hell, the lake of fire is what they usually have in mind. The Bible uses three main words to describe where the ungodly may go when they die. So Sheol is the Hebrew word with the idea of the place of the dead, the abode of the dead. It has no direct reference to either torment or eternal happiness. The idea of Sheol is often accurately expressed as the grave. Hades is the Greek word used to describe the world beyond. In the Bible, it's generally the same idea as Sheol. Revelation chapter 9 verse 1 speaks of the bottomless pit. This place is called the Abyssos. It's a prison for a certain demons. In Luke chapter 8 verse 31, 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 4, and Jude 6 for the angels that left their first estate. And so, or more and generally, it's considered part of the realm of the dead. In Romans 10 verse 7 is used in the sense of Hades. Gehenna is the Greek word borrowed from the Hebrew language. In Mark 9, verse 43 and 44, Jesus speaks of hell, Gehenna. Hell is a Greek translation of the Hebrew Valley of Hinnom, a place outside of Jerusalem's walls desecrated by Moloch worship and human sacrifice in 2 Chronicles 28 and Jeremiah chapter 32. It was also a garbage dump where rubbish and refuse was burned, and the smoldering fires and festering worms of the Valley of Hinnom made it a graphic and effective picture of the fate of the damned. So this is the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels. In Matthew 25, verse 41, men only go to this place prepared for the devil and his angels if they reject God's salvation and they condemn themselves. It's their own choice. So as there is a second and higher life, so there is a second and deeper death. And as after that life, there is no more death. So after that death, there is no more life. And so the devil and the damned have punishment without pity, misery without mercy, sorrow without succor, crying without comfort, mischief without measure, and torments without end and past imagination.